I wanted to, to start by simply telling you a few stories of the people that we met, the people that we saw in the displacement camps that Regina already has alluded to, and to find out really what is their future now. I'm going to start by telling the story of two elderly women that we met that first evening, that we touched down. As Neville said, uh, got this call, went out to Erbil Airport. This was uh, Thursday, not have just gone, but the one before. And that very evening, we sat down in a particular camp and got speaking to these two people behind me. Their names are Victoria and Gazara. And they're both neighbors, widows, aged about 80, if not exactly that age. And they have spent, until now, all their lives in one particular town, which Regina referred to, Carmeles, which is one of the oldest Christian communities outside Mosul in the famous name of Nineveh, the Nineveh Plains. And there they had lived for all those years until the night of the 6th of August, when word spread through their village that forces from the Islamic State were about to invade. Well, everybody left, except those either too ill or too frail to make that journey. And inevitably, aged 80, these two elderly women were unable to make that journey. So they locked their doors that night and hoped against hope. Next morning, they set out from their houses to do what they do every morning, and that is to go to what hopefully will be my next slide, which is the church of St. Adai in Karamlez, a church that I visited. This is my slide that I took when I visited that church in happier times in 2008. I went to that church to go to Mass in the normal way, but they found the church was locked, that there was nobody around. It was completely silent. And they knew that ISIS had come, and so they made it straight back home, back to their respective homes, and they stayed in those homes for four days until eventually the inevitable happened and ISIS caught up with them and they brought them to what is in fact a shrine on the edge of Karamlez, uh, the shrine of St. Barbara. And there they found themselves alongside 10 or a dozen similarly disabled elderly people who'd been rounded up by ISIS. And they were then told their fate. Being elderly, they were told, convert and then we'll think what we'll do next but they refused to convert. And the moment of truth came when we had the translation, it was all done through an interpreter, as to what one of the elderly women said to uh, the ISIS attackers. And you can see this is an exact translation from the Arabic of what she said when she was told to convert. And they threatened that they would be killed, but this woman had the temerity, the courage, to say what you see on your screens, and culminating in these wonderful, wonderfully, beautifully words, we believe that if we show love and kindness, forgiveness and mercy, this is our vision of paradise. It is not your vision of paradise. It is our vision, and we are prepared to die for it. And I, the, the translation afterwards, when we got it back from the Arabic, the, the priest translating it said that the others were all <laughs> terrified at their temerity of uh, spirit. But nonetheless, the Islamic forces were so shocked that apparently they had nothing to say. And they were somehow let go. And hence how I was able to meet them and tell their story. And I thought I'd start with this story because for me it became emblematic. It became uh, example after example of how these people had made this choice to stand by their faith come what may. Maybe they have to move, maybe they have to leave their homes, but what is certain 
is that they are not going to move from the faith that they professed all their lives. And that's a key message for us to put across to you, how that faith will survive in spite of change and turmoil and indeed emigration. An exodus, as indeed Regina had alluded to, of 120,000, it's very difficult to get our heads around these figures, isn't it? But 120,000 people left these towns, city of Mosul, and uh, Karamlaz, and the other towns that make up the Nineveh plains, and they fled in these two main centers uh, to, the, to the north. And we'll see that here, uh, they went into the Kurdish region in a very, very difficult Overnight, they traveled from Mosul, uh, from Karamlaz and from the other Nineveh towns and made their way to uh, Kurdistan. Many of them had to walk. Many of them were able to hitch a lift. And they have now come. And we, when we arrived that evening, that Thursday, we saw the situation in which they were now living. These were people who lived in ordinary homes like you and I up until just a few months ago and now reduced to living in tents. This was the journey they made, the photographs we have of that, and then this is the situation they now live in. It seems, fortunately, that very few, if any, suffered violence at the hands of the militants, and this is something for which the bishops, the priests, and the sisters have given thanks for God. They may have lost their homes, they may have lost their churches, but they have not uh, suffered any physical damage. But there are some who were hurt. One story that we heard was about a, an elderly man who, in fact, was ISIS caught up with him, and they got out a flex, like one of these flexes, and they swacked him over the head with this flex. And they told him, if you don't convert, and if you don't leave, they'll be far worse. So there was certainly the threat always there of worse to come, and they'd lost all their possessions. You probably, some of you have read in the internet how they lost their homes, as well as uh, their mobile phones, their laptops, as they left their places where they lived. The uh, extremist groups collected these items from them as they sought to leave. And in one case, we have this story of uh, a young boy, aged about six, and the uh, Islamic fighters spotted that he was wearing a hearing aid, and they thought, they said, hand it over. And they said, why, how would you, why would you want somebody's hearing aid? There's a little boy of six. How, why would you, we need the battery. So the boy had to walk off into the night without his hearing aid, all because of this battery, so it was said. So this situation is, um, becoming very desperate now. Why now? Because these people are facing winter. A winter without a proper home, without proper schools, without proper help. And what Regina and the Projects Department of Aid to the Church in Need have done is to make a major decision to really reach out an olive branch on behalf of all of us here to enable them to survive a harsh winter that temperatures well below zero. And that's why we felt that it was important to make this follow-up trip to see exactly the forms of help which Regina, of course, has covered. And one of the things that explains why we as a charity have taken this step, uh, one reason was very clearly explained by Archbishop Bashar Warder, who was really our host in Erbil. Uh, there he is pictured. And we had this interview with him in which he set the record straight. The reality is that Christians have suffered and have received no support. Christians have received no support from the central government and they have done nothing for them, absolutely nothing. So who is helping? He also said that in some instances, government had provided relief for the many other minority, many other faith communities, Muslim communities who had left, but none for the Christians, none for the Yazidis, none for the other minority groups, but specifically none for the Christians. So that is why 
we are seeking as a charity to save a, a generation of people who until very recently were living ordinary lives in extraordinary circumstances. So our job was to really speak to some of these people to find out their stories. In many cases, despite all the traumas, they said to us, we just want to go home. And this is significant because when, as representatives of Aid to the Church in Need, we go to uh, places of persecution, normally the response we have is we would like to go anywhere where it's safe, and if we have to say goodbye to our homes, so be it. But here, the cultural, the historical, the spiritual home of the Christians in Mosul, which again Regina has alluded to, was something that stood out so clearly that they really were willing to go back, even if it meant an element of risk. And this was something that really made, was made plain to us in the numerous interviews that we had. And here is our response to the situation. Again, almost on our first evening, we were taken to what was quickly named the Verenfree Village for the people who could not make it to their homelands back because of the continuing presence of ISIS. Aid to the Church in Need is constructing uh, or putting in place these porter cabin villages, recognizing that they cannot survive a winter in such harsh conditions in the desert. And hence why we were able to see some of these camps, some of these uh, porter cabins being put into place. All the bishops with whom Aid to the Church in Need has, have worked uh, have spoken to us about the need to provide school schooling. And this is something that, again, we were able to see. All the time that we were there, people would say to us, we want to keep the schooling going because we do not want the children to turn to violence. One of the things that most, I found most saddening was we went to one camp and we saw the, the children uh, in a tent, hundreds and hundreds of them doing drawings, filling their time really without proper education for the time being before they moved to the schools. And I saw a group of them around a very large piece of paper and I wanted to know what they were drawing. And it turned out that they were drawing what they could remember, which many of them knew very well, of the cathedral in Karakosh, which again, I have visited. And the boys were saying, we want to go back to see our cathedral. And I remember thinking, um, gosh, when are they ever going to see this cathedral again? Um, we know from all the reports we've had that ISIS, where it has entered a town, where it's entered a village, where it's entered a city, has systematically removed the Christian statues, symbols, crosses, all the various elements that define a church as such, they have removed. So when the little boy told me, I'm coloring the flame of the candle on top of the uh, altar there, I knew that that was one of the things that almost certainly would now have disappeared. And the whole issue is to keep the Christian communities, uh, particularly the young people, particularly those who have not got proper education at the moment, focused on the future. And for me, what that was brought home very powerfully by uh, Father Douglas Buzzy. Now, Father Douglas, who he has the, the manner, uh, not only the look, but also the manner of the actor Robert De Niro, a very sort of he, he's just got a very easy way. He's laughing and smiling and his wonderful way of wor with words. But he, in fact, has suffered at the hands of extremists himself. For nine days, he was kidnapped by the predecessors to ISIS. And during that time, uh, they smashed all his teeth. They took a hammer to his back. And he said to us, that after they, he finally was released, um, the one thing that became clear to him was that these young people who had kidnapped him had had no education. And he'd taken the decision to go from Baghdad 
to the villages to ensure that these children at least have some education. And he said, we do not want them turning into Daesh, which Daesh is Islamic State, of course, the Arabic for Islamic State. He said it with a smile, but there was an undertone of seriousness about the, the, the real threat of these young people turning to violence to act out the aggression, the bitterness of losing everything they had, and to steer them on a path towards the Christian virtues and values that all of us here hold dear. So that was something that for us became very, very apparent. We also were there to oversee the process of putting together the applications uh, for the aid that we at Aid to the Church Need are giving out. And one of the most moving things that we found was talking to some of these young children who are receiving Christmas gifts. This is a major focus of our help now, which is to provide 15,000 children aged between two and eight with Christmas gifts. I think it de deserves repeating that Regina has alluded to it already, but it deserves repeating the things that these children are being given. Of course, they're getting toys. They're, also, they're getting child's Bibles. They're also getting devotional items coloring books, pencils, all those sort of things. And the bishop have said to us, we do not just want to hand these gifts out to whoever is aged between two and 12 in De Hook and Ankal. We want each gift to be have the name of a child on that gift so that they feel that they have been remembered by those who are providing those gifts and the rabbi, that they are remembered by name, not just by number, but by name. And I spoke to two of these children to whom we will be giving gifts, uh, Rania and Ranin, the 10-year-old twins. And of course, I'm a twin, so inevitably, twins have a special meaning for me. And uh, these two young children are supported by their mother in this displacement camp outside the cathedral in Ankawa, St. Joseph Cathedral. And their mother, uh, the children's father, uh, had, had been killed in a bomb blast in 2009. And so the mother now feels very bereft. She's lost her husband, now she's lost her home. And she said to me, I felt I was coping. And then ISIS came. And now what? What future is there for Rania and Ranin in this country? It's a very poignant moment. And it's a moment that... Uh, in a way that makes you think of all the, the numbers of Christians who have left. We, at least a million, possibly 1.5 million that were there before 2003, before uh, the fall of Saddam Hussein and his regime. And now, the latest estimates, perhaps 275,000, of which 110,000 are displaced. So this means that the future for Christianity in Iraq is very much hanging in the balance. What we're doing is enabling those who want to stay to stay, and we're helping those who want to find a future elsewhere, if they want to pursue that option, to go for that. I wanted to uh, finish, really, knowing that time is of the essence, with some prayers that were given to me by Archbishop Amal Nona. Archbishop Amal Nona is the Bishop of Mosul. And it, was, it fell to him to be the bishop who was to witness the end of the presence of Christianity in Mosul after 1,800 years. It is his diocese that has been most tragically affected by the violence that's been going on for so long in this country. And I spoke to him. He now lives in just a, a small uh, room, uh, part of the buildings of the diocese of Erbil, the neighboring diocese, and he, he hesitated a long time, eventually he allowed me to interview him. And I ended the interview by saying, I am speaking to the benefactors of Aid to the Church in Need uh, this coming weekend. If you were here, what would you ask them to pray for? What would you say is most urgent in your mind by way of prayer? So these are his, if you like, prayer requests. First and foremost, pray that they will not be attacked by ISIS. 
So the threat is there. We know that. We pray for their safety. The second is to pray for those who persecute us. He himself can speak with full voice about the persecution. He has suffered it. His priests have been maimed, have been killed, have been kidnapped. So he knows that it's difficult to do that, but he insists that we do it. And the third and final thing is he talked about what he described as a surge of evil in the world that we're witnessing in our own time today. And he prayed that we work together, that we pray together, that we act together to overcome this process of evil that it seems to be building up in our world and seems to be growing. So I felt this was a man looking at the world head on, but bringing to it the eyes of faith. And it made me think, thinking of faith, of those two women with who, where I started this talk today. And I remember at the very end of the time that I spoke to them, uh, one of them, I think it was Victoria, uh, put her arms out and she said, Ebony, Ebony, like this. I didn't know what this word Ebony meant, but I, I went forward and she embraced me. And she said, uh, after a few words, and I spoke to Archbishop Amel, who was our guide, and I said, what does this word ebony mean? And he said, oh, it means my child, my child. And um, I really, I went away thinking that I was indeed a child, sitting at the feet of women of great fortitude, great faith, and great friendship. Thank you very much.